Hi, I'm Dr. Phil Perconti, the director of the U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command's Army Research Laboratory. I think we should start by telling folks that the Army has a corporate research laboratory. Its mission is to do disruptive research for the long term. We are mostly responsible for thinking about technology beyond 2035. And so what science, what research has to be done to affect disruptive warfighting capability in the long term? That's the Army Research Laboratory's primary mission. So we have a collection of some very talented folks here, uh, about uh, 2,600 people. As a corporate research laboratory, we have some 55% of our research staff are at the PhD level, and we're doing fundamental research. I define fundamental research as research that is basic and applied, but leads to a disruption. And that disruption is a way to think about research that changes ideas or leads to new ideas, that changes the way people think about scientific paradigms, that changes the way people think about warfighting ultimately because our customers are soldiers. So how do we take the science and, and the technology that we work on and use it either to change the way people think about science, as I said, change scientific paradigms, or change the way we think about warfighting? And that's the intent of doing disruptive research. So new ideas, new innovation, new science that ultimately leads to changes in the way we fight and we protect our soldiers and ultimately win our nation's wars. That's IRL's fundamental mission. Secondly, we're the Army's face to the worldwide academic community. We have our Open Campus Initiative, uh, and we have our Army Research Office, both of which are really the external face to the worldwide academic community. And the reason we're so involved with the academic community for the Army is we want to bring the best and brightest in the university systems across the country and internationally to, to come and work with us and invite them to come and work with us on Army problems, to solve Army-specific problems. It's with encouragement from our staff and collaboration and partnership through our staff and our extramural activities that we have these engagements and we vector folks who perhaps ordinarily wouldn't want to think about Army problems into our space. These problems are so complex that it requires a multidisciplinary approach and it requires diversity of thought. All of that is driven by our ability to work with the external academic community. So that's a very important piece of what we do. And then lastly, as the corporate laboratory, we are now responsible for bringing together science and technology and warfighting concepts, the development of concepts uh, early on, which is very, very important. When you think about new ways of fighting, how do the Army of the future is going to look based on technology? What you want to do to be successful is have conversations between soldiers and scientists at the very beginning so that we can both have an understanding of what the technology can do, what the future of that technology will look like, and then how is that implemented in a warfighting scenario? How will that really change what the Army looks like? What is it, how will it affect the architecture of the Army? How will it affect the, the kit that soldiers bring into the battlefield? Those conversations we want to have early, and so that's the third piece of our mission is to work with the Army Futures Command uh, Futures and Concepts Center to bring s and and concepts requirements together. So that's kind of who we are today. This is a um, collaborative environment. And to collaborate, you have to understand where people are coming from, what they, what they think is important, what their language is. Oftentimes we use the same words, depending upon where you're from, those words have different meanings. So getting together with people and communicating on as many different levels as possible is, is the intent here. So uh, however we can use this to reach a wide audience, uh, this is just one avenue for that because that's our intent, is to make sure that people understand our mission, the problems we're trying to solve. And I'm here with Megan Small this morning. Uh, Megan, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, I'm a research chemist in the biotechnology branch of the Sensors and Electronic Devices Directorate. 
What do you do, Megan? Yeah, so um, I'm a part of the um, Living Materials Program. I'm also part of the Transformational Synthetic Biology ERP. ERP, so that's that's one of ARL's essential research programs, which is one of our top priority programs. We do many things across the laboratory. Uh, we have a wide swath of technology that we have to uh, do research on for the Army. Because we're into everything, uh, it's very important for us to have a set of programs that are focused and our priority. So synthetic biology is becoming one of those areas where there's more and more interest uh, from an Army science perspective, uh, but not so much from an Army modernization perspective because uh, it's such an emerging area. Uh, I think most of the folks on the uniform side don't really understand just yet what the implications are for synthetic biology from a warfighting perspective. So tell me a little bit. So I'm a double E, actually. My PhD is in electrical computer engineering. Not that I do research anymore. Uh, but when I first got to SED, uh, I looked at those uh, schematics, those biological schematics. Uh, it was nothing but um, confusion in my mind. So it took me a little while to understand some of what uh, synthetic biology is. But what, give me a, a few minutes on synthetic biology. We're taking uh, bacterial cells or fungal cells, taking biology and we're transforming it to uh, what we want it to do. And um, that's, you know, I'm on the modeling and simulation side. Um, so I'm trying to understand the end control with ultimate goal of control, um, how a biological material is interacting with non-biological material. So what gets you excited about that? <laughs> yeah, so um, my background actually before I came to ARL um, is in drug design. So I was all into the medical world. And then when I came here, it's really exciting for me to take the skill set that I learned in that type of design toward designing now biomaterials and um, learning a lot in terms of how biological molecules interact with material um, and it's really uh, an emerging area like you said there's a lot to learn a lot that we don't understand I think and uh, so I really want to be a part of that understanding so what do you think some of the most pressing problems are what, what are the big open research questions in synthetic biology yeah so how do we control biology if it can be controlled uh, <laughs> as much as we can control it on the time scales that we want, um, on the length scales that we want, and drive that toward uh, you know whatever outcome that we want. You know those that's the big we have to answer those questions. And you, you, it's nascent, right? So do you think uh, where are we on a timeline? If you were to if you were to do some technology forecasting for me, when do you think we're going to see First, to develop that understanding, and then some of the first big applications for synthetic biology. Yeah, so in terms of applications, we're already kind of seeing the beginnings of them. These um, self-healing types of systems, like the bioconcrete, um, where you uh, use water to activate um, a sleeping bacteria and that bacteria secretes the components you need for concrete so um, that is an easier application so we're kind of already there but in terms of really self-healing where you have the um, components out in the field and they're assembling um, into whatever product you want um, yeah I'd say 2040 and beyond okay so we're a good 30 years you think probably right until it becomes prolific not only commercially but in military applications that's really interesting to me uh, I think the other question that I often uh, have with this is what what are the surprises like so when you started you said you were in drug discovery right what was the big surprise when you came from the drug world into sort of this defense sector that you're living in today um, 
Yes, that's a good question. I think the methods are that what surprised me was the methods are similar. You know, you're taking these experiments or models, um, but the outcomes are so different. You know, military outcomes, uh, protecting the soldier, making him lethal, and those types of things. It's uh, very different from the drug design world where, you know, it's smaller scale, um, I guess you could say, especially the niche that I'm in. Um, So that surprised me a little bit just the scale of things i guess i understand that the manufacturing and the scale up of bio is an area where their that company ginkgo bioworks is making great progress what do you think about that is that do you think we're close there to really scaling up where we are in terms of scale up it's so hard because it really depends on the application and the system So the type of bacteria, for instance, modifying one bacteria versus another bacteria, you know, it could take you a year to figure out how to engineer a particular type of bacteria. Uh Um, And just because biology does what it wants to do, and that's why the understanding is so important to control it. Um, And that's what we're working on. But, yeah, scaling up, that's, I think that we we are there in in terms of the scale up the hardest part is just how do you get that first piece the engineering okay so now i'm going to put you on the spot <laughs> if i had a general officer here with me and i were to say sir we have a real opportunity with synthetic biology mm-hmm. These are some of the capabilities that we think we're going to see from synthetic biology in the future. And this is what the Army is going to get from all of this investment that we're going to make Mm -hmm. in synthetic biology. And I've got Megan here to tell you exactly (laughs) what that is. What would you say? Uh, I think the biggest thing is that custom materials, basically materials on demand. You have these all of these components, and um, you know they could self-assemble. You trigger it a certain way, and it will assemble into whatever that you want. Um, that's the making side. I'm also very interested in the breaking side. You know, how do we take biology and break down materials? Um, and you know, that's that's important for not leaving a trace where we are for instance, or um, in trying to impact um, our, our adversary. Right, so the flip side of that is protection, mm-hmm. right? So I think, um, what would you say about synthetic biology from a protective materials point of view? Yeah, so um, I think that's very interesting because I think the material, the biological, biologically based materials can be extremely protective, but they're not thought of that way. Mm-hmm. These materials, when they assemble together, they're very strong. Our bone, for instance, is strong. You know, uh, these when you assemble these biological materials, um, and that can be a protective. You know, it's not just a piece of metal or you know something like that, which is very heavy. Um, these biological polymers can be uh, protective for you know the soldier to wear. You can also put them on vehicles, you know. Right, right. And what's cool about it is that it's not only a protective part because of the way those molecules interact with each other, but you can custom those molecules to maybe have a heat signature or chemical signature or mask those signatures. So, you know, they're very versatile pieces. That's very interesting. Oftentimes, uh, I think some people, when they hear synthetic biology or living materials we talk about fungus Mm -hmm. or we talk about the genome in some way shape or form or another people think that these things are actually alive yeah right can you talk a little bit about that yeah so um you know that's kind of something even i go back and forth with what is truly alive if a cell is in a spore form kind of a sleeping inactivated form um some people i've talked to argue that's not living um, but um, yeah these in my mind living materials is taking biological material and that doesn't have to be a whole cell 
It could just be the components of it, proteins or DNA or whatever. And um, embedding those onto non-biological material, and that to me is the living material. So does that does that mean that our soldiers have to worry that there are uh, any any coatings or anything we put on our future platforms <laughs> will have to be care and fed? No, yeah. is it like these are not like chia pets we're going to grow on. Our that would be cool, but um, no. So yeah, it depends on the time time. You know, all cells need to be fed. So if you're going to use living cells, then they will. But if you only want something for a short time, it does its job and then it dies. And the great thing about biology, it's that, you know, it's just disintegrates. You know, you don't have to worry about something out there left that you have to go retrieve. Okay. We talked at the intro about concepts and changing the way the Army fights in the future. What do you think synthetic biology could be applied to. So I have a group of soldiers on the battlefield, and they have a mission that's part of what's called multi-domain operations. Where do we think the biggest benefit from synthetic biology would come from initially? Just, just take a shot. I mean, what do you think about it? when you think when you're thinking about these problems, and you're writing up your research results. Often we, we talk about it in the context of how we're going to contribute to the academic literature or build on the science. But I, don't, I want, to, want you to think about this from the perspective of how can we help our soldiers and how can we, again, change the way they think about warfare. So, so from everything you've learned today, where do we think we could put this where do we think we could put this work to help educate inform our concept developers so that they can start to think about how the future army will look and how the future army will organize and eventually how the future army will will fight yeah so i guess i think of it in terms of so biology is so versatile um you, I think of a soldier now, and I think of him or her loaded down with a lot of equipment, um, wearing heavy gear, and I think of biology and the soldier of the future that they're not loaded down with all that stuff. You know, they could wear armor that can um, is light. Is, you know, biological cells are not as heavy as other things. Um, and the, that armor has multiple functions or whatever pieces of equipment can heal themselves so they don't have to worry about carrying extra components. Um, those, the living materials or synthetic biology can be used to make, um, you know, in, in terms of microbial fuel cells, so you could have a piece of equipment that is generating power that can power other devices that that soldier will carry. So I think of it in making the soldier um, more in, less encumbered by mm-hmm. all of the stuff that he or she yeah, has to so, wear. So, you know? so synthetic biology has the potential for that. Mm-hmm. So we talked about synthetic biology like really coming to fruition in 30 or 40 years. But there are some nearer-term applications that people are working on today. Can can you describe anything you're doing? Yeah, so um, w- we are uh, looking at ways that we can take existing materials that um, and use synthetic biology to repair those materials. So um, while more far term is the self assembly and self healing of the materials, um, the shorter term we can take biological material and use it to uh, fix cracks in um, whatever material that it is. Um, and we are uh, working with uh, WMRD as well as VTD on those types of applications. Um, cracks in um, yeah, the, the blade and, and things like that, So, um, or cracks in armor. Yeah, so the Vehicle Technology Directorate and the Weapons and Materials Research Directorate are two of ARL's uh, 
business units. So the, we can't underestimate the notion of using synthetic biology to do self-healing, self-assembly, materials on demand. And there's a whole uh, gamut of applications that this new science will open up. Yeah, it's funny. I uh, When I do talk to the kids at STEM stuff, um, I t you know, all kids have cell phones and, you know, they drop, they crack the screen. I just cracked mine at the airport. Um, and I envision where you just set it on the heating pad and it, the screen will just repair itself. You know, that's what we're driving towards. So, um, I, and that's definitely, it's doable. Even that's before crazy. 2040, I think. You know, we're just beginning to scratch the surface of what applications can make use of this, not only commercially, but more importantly for the United States Army. We want to move away from science fiction to real science, science reality. <laughs> Many thanks to Dr. Megan Small for joining us for what is a new podcast, ARL, What We Learned Today. In the upcoming episodes, we'll explore new discoveries and foundational research that will make American soldiers stronger and safer please consider clicking subscribe and joining us for future episodes. I'm Dr. Phil Perconti. Thanks for listening.